Hopefully you had uh, something really good to eat. And your dessert was such that you're not going to drop off into a sugar coma on me. <laughs> through the end of the, uh, through the uh, end of the service. So we'll get cranked back up. For this one you'll need your your salmon colored one or your peach or ugly or whatever. <laughs> the what? Might look, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know colors. I know red, yellow, blue, green, orange. He doesn't even dress himself. It's really bad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we got that on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a really great preacher. I didn't, I didn't know there was like different shape, like, you know, like I've got a pair of navy slacks, apparently. Yes. Well, they look black to me. I mean, they're like, well, my black slack, those aren't black, they're navy. So anyway, we had this discussion before. So I won't have it again tonight. <laughs> Move right along. So anyway, all right, we're in First uh, John chapter five. We're going to wrap up First John uh, tonight. Is in the last part of our of our time together tonight. Uh, let's just dig in. Verse one, John says, "Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves Him." Who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. He, uh, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So, um, verses one and verses two. What what's John saying here as it pertains pertains to loving one another? What's the logic here? Right. So, so if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So to believe in Jesus makes me God's child. All right. Then if I, if I'm God's child, look at verse, um, verse one, uh, everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So to believe in Jesus is is to is to be God's child. To be God's child is to love God's children. In and, and to love God's children is to love God. By this we know that we uh, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Verse two. Um, and this is the love. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So here's here's the. Here's the logic of the argument that John is making. If I believe in Jesus, that makes me God's child. If I'm God's child, then I should love God's children. And if I love God's children, then that means I love God. And if I love God, I should obey God. So it's all tied together. To know God is to love God. To love God is to obey God. And to know God and to love God is to love God's children. They're all tied together. Now, um, he says, this is the victory, I'm in verse four, that has overcome the world, our faith. Um, it makes me want to sing that hymn, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Um, so how is faith the victory that overcomes the world? You're all just kind of... Staring at me with deer in the headlight. Look. The battle is already won. Do what? The battle is already won. Yeah, the battle is won. So, so it's faith that you know, it's faith in that in that 
victory that's been won through Jesus. Um, you know, he who is of God uh, is greater than he who is in the world. Because the, the one, if we are of God, then, then, then he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And our faith is tied to love and obedience. So if I'm talking about overcoming the world, I'm, I'm really talking about overcoming the entanglements of the world. Uh, so how do I how do I defeat the flesh? How do I defeat um, the entanglements of this world? Well, it's through faith because it, to, faith enables me to know God. To know God is to love God. To love God is to obey God. Uh, so if I'm obeying God, then then I'm. I am defeating the flesh and I'm overcoming the entanglements of this world. It's all tied to faith, right? So how is, how is light, love, faith, and obedience all interrelated? In verse one, we see that believers are born of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So believers are born of God. Verse two, we see that if I'm born of God, I, I love God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And then in verse three, to love God is to obey God. So it's all tied together. Uh, to, be, to, to know God is to love God, to love God is to obey God. To know and love God is to love his children. So it's all tied together. Questions on those verses? All right, let's look on into verse six. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the son. And he who has the son has life he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Okay, so let's look for just a minute in this, in this phrase that, that seems a bit odd perhaps to us. This one Jesus Christ came by water and by blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit bears witness because, uh, because the Spirit is true. Three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, referring to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Okay, so what in the world does this mean that Jesus came by water and blood? So he came in the flesh. Uh, so there's there's different interpretive options of this. Okay, so I'm going to give you I'm going to give you three of them, and then I'll let you decide which one you you uh, like the best, or which one you think is correct. <clears throat> um, I'll tell you the one that I lean towards, but in no way am I telling you what you have to believe. Um, but uh, but there are different ideas because it is kind of an, uh, an obscure saying. So the idea in the context is that he's talking about um, this threefold witness, threefold witness to, to Jesus being the son of God. That, that's the idea. Uh, three in heaven, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three on earth, he says, the, the, the water, the blood, the spirit. So there's different ideas. There's this idea, well, water uh, sounds like uh, this idea of baptism. 
um, and and the two ordinances of the church, um, the the baptism being the water idea and the the cup of the Lord's Supper being um, being the idea of the blood. So this witness is given in the baptism uh, and the Lord's Supper uh, of of Jesus. So that's one. <clears throat> there's a there's the idea that when at the crucifixion, when uh, when Jesus dies, and they're you know they go to break the bones of uh, the break the legs of those that are crucified um, to speed up the process of them dying, and Jesus is already dead, and in order to make sure, uh, Centurion takes the. Um, the Roman soldier takes the spear and he pierces the side of Jesus and blood and water come out. Um, and there's some that said, well, this is, the, this is what's meant, the blood and water here. Um, there is the idea uh, that, that it is baptism, Jesus' baptism um, and his death that give witness that it is the water at the baptism that that you know, this is the what the idea of the water is baptism and then his death on the cross is the blood um, if you think in terms of the context of it being the uh, the threefold witness at at the baptism of jesus you have the picture of the trinity you have jesus being baptized in the water you have the voice from heaven of the Father. Uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And you have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. Um, and then um, at, the, at the cross, you have Jesus' Son dying. Uh, you, you have um, the Father, uh, this the Spirit, Jesus commends his Spirit into the hands of the Father. So this idea that... that um, one who came by water and blood, um, that um, it, it, to give testimony of who he is, and the spirit bearing witness. So this is the threefold witness, the water, the blood, uh, and the spirit. So uh, I, I tend to lean towards number three. Now you can, you can also take it um, uh, in terms of, in terms of birth, water idea being physical birth and blood. Uh, however, um, in the context, it seems as though it's talking in terms of, of, of testimony of who Jesus is. Uh, so in, in, that, in that sense, it seems as though it's talking more, at least to me, it seems as though it's talking more in terms of baptism uh, because that's where uh, Jesus is, is attested to as being um, being the Son of God uh, it, at, at his baptism, at his death, um, you know, he at his birth. I mean, we've all been born, but but at his baptism and his death, he's attested to as the Son of God. So you can pick which one you you like the best or think is the most correct. There, I tend to lean towards. The idea of baptism and death. Now, let's look at this where he says, if we, if verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed the testimony that God has given. So how do we make God a liar by rejecting Jesus? Yeah, so God himself is the one testifying that, that Jesus is the way of salvation. So by rejecting that, we, we're actually calling God a liar. Now, most people don't think of it in those terms. But if, if God has called us sinners uh, and, and told us that the way of salvation is through Jesus... And if we reject that and seek salvation in any other way outside of Jesus, we're actually making God out to be 
a liar. Um, and eternal life is, is tied to the believe in the testimony of God about Jesus because we must believe that Jesus is the way of salvation. I mean, um, God has said, this is the way. And eternal life is tied to that. You cannot, you cannot go, you cannot get to God. You cannot attain eternal life in any other way other than the, the way that God has chosen to offer it. Um, you know, if I, you know, if I, if I invite you to my house and I say, okay, what I want you to do is, you know, certain, certain time be there, come to the front door and ring the doorbell and I'll let you in and you can come visit. Well, the only way you get into my house is to come and ring the doorbell. I mean, if you come trying to come climb through the bedroom window or something like that, bad things will happen to you, you know? It doesn't work that way. Well, it, you can't climb in the back door of heaven. There, there's no other way other than the way that God has, has ordained for it to be, and that's through Jesus Christ. So that's the idea on that part of it. Questions? All right, let's look at, on to verse 14 now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. All right, so that gives us some pretty interesting things to talk about for just a, just a minute. Um, so what promises do we have when we pray according to God's will? He hears, he hears us. And the idea there is he hears favorably. <clears throat> In other words, I mean, I think God hears all prayers. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I heard, I've heard people say, the only prayer of a lost person that God hears is the prayer of repentance. Well, for, I don't read that in scripture. I think God hears all prayers. But the idea here of hearing is hear favorably as, it, as to answer. And notice that if we pray according to his will, he hears us in a favorable way. And then what's, what's the other promise? Regarding his will. Well, if we pray according to his will, he hears us in what? We have what we ask. He'll give us what we ask for. Um, uh, that little verb is in the present tense. We, you know, we have. We, we are obtaining what we're asking. We're getting what we're asking for if we're asking in his, in his will. That's, that's the idea. Um, but key here is praying according to his will. Um, he's not a genie in a bottle uh, that, you know, that exists to do our bidding. Um, so, you know, I'll give you, I give you a little multiple choice here about, uh, about prayer. So uh, looking at these statements, you tell me uh, which one you think is, is true about prayer. How about the first one? If I pray hard enough, I can get whatever I want from God. That doesn't work. I've, I've done it. I've tried. I've prayed hard. And you don't always get everything you want from God. Um, prayer is bending God's will to fit mine. Not, not so either. You know, and I've, I've known a great many people that have that idea. And really, that's, that's the error of this whole name it, claim it uh, philosophy of prayer. It, you know, if I just have enough faith and I name it and I claim it, then God is honor bound to give me whatever I want. Well, here's the deal. Who's the God in that picture? Me. I'm, I'm the one that gets to decide how things are going to be. And I name it and I claim it. And I go and tell all my friends that, that I've prayed it in faith and I've claimed it. Now, God, if you don't give me what I ask for, it makes you look bad. You see? Now, who's, I mean, seriously, right? Who's the God in that picture? I am. 
So prayer is not bending God's will to fit mine. How about prayer is bending my will to fit God's? That's what prayer really is. Prayer is about bending my will to fit God's. When I begin to get my, through prayer, I begin to pray and, and, and God begins to shape my will to his will. You remember Jesus in the garden. Now, nobody was a better prayer warrior than Jesus. I mean, that's probably a huge understatement. In the garden, the night before he's crucified, what does he pray? Father, yeah, exactly. Not my way. Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. He comes out to find his three closest friends in the world. And what are they doing? They're asleep. Wake up and pray. Satan wants to sift you like wheat, he tells Peter. But I'm praying for you. And he goes back. Three times he prays the, same, the exact same thing. Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. By the time he gets through praying the third time, he gets up, he goes back. His three closest friends in the world, what are they doing? They're still asleep. He says, rise up, let's be going, my betrayer is hand. He, at hand. He's ready to face the cross. But prayer for him was not about bending the Father's will to meet his will. And he said, at any point, I could call down legions of angels to rescue me from the cross. But how would the scripture be fulfilled then? Prayer for Jesus wasn't about bending the Father's will to fit his own, but rather tuning, fine-tuning his will to fit the Father's. And that's what prayer ought to be for you and me. Yes, ma'am. I can't. I can't hear what you're saying. She's quoting the model prayer to the disciples. The model prayer to the disciples. Thy will be done on earth as it is. Yes, yes, thy will. Yes, yes. The model prayer. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's raining on us. Tin roof. All right. Um. Hang on a second. She said just because just because you don't get a yes answer doesn't mean that God doesn't hear you. Sometimes you get a no, sometimes you get a wait. Uh, and, and that's that's true. Um, so anyway, I, I mean, I think you all have been around me long enough to kind of know my, my view of prayer. I, I Prayer is far more about me changing what I want than what and ch me changing what God wants to do. It, it's far more about God changing the want to in me than me changing the wants of God. Um, so that's how I see prayer anyway. Now let's let's focus for just a second on this idea of a, the sin leading to death because that's, that's an interesting phrase. To, look at verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should pray about that. So what in the world is John talking about here? It's, it's, it almost seems kind of out of the blue. He, he switches gears. We're talking about loving our brother and praying, and the next thing we know, we're talking about somebody committing a sin leading to death, and I don't say you should even pray for him. What in the world is he talking about? Well, you're hoping I'll tell you, don't you? <laughs> you were just hoping that I would tell you. Okay, so, and again, there, there's different interpretations of this, so I'll give you, as kind of as we did before, I'll give you three uh 
interpretations that people have put forth and I'll, I'll tell you which one I lean towards and you can, you can select which one you think is true or add a new one to the list if you choose. Um, so there are some that say uh, that there are different kinds of sins, that there is mortal sins and venial sins. Um, you hear this a lot in the Catholic tradition. Um, more, you know, venial sins are the little, the little sins that don't really matter, like telling a white lie or maybe going 56 and a 55. You know, that's not really, that's not a big sin. That, that's just a little sin, right? The mortal sins are the the really bad stuff, right? The stuff that you know that's it's really bad. You know, uh, murder, uh, adultery. You know. That kind of stuff is the the really you know uh, go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Kind of deal, uh, you know. So so he's saying that well, this is you know if you see your brother sinning, it's a little sin. Pray for him and he'll be spared. But man, there's there's these bad sins and you know uh, these are the sins leading to death. What's the problem with that? Sin is sin. I mean, isn't that what we, we're taught? There is no big sin and little sin. Paul teaches that uh, if I break part of the law, I'm guilty of the whole law. You know, the same God that said, do not murder and do not commit adultery also said, don't covet. Right? I mean, if I go 56 in a 55, I'm just as much a lawbreaker as if I commit murder and adultery. So I'm still guilty of the law. So that that argument... You thought that was funny? I don't know. <laughs> he said, thank goodness those aren't unforgettable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Had you were in there for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you meant to drive in 56 to 55 and not to murder adultery. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. I'm thinking of going out and killing somebody, preacher. I just want to know, can I be forgiven before I do <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that doesn't seem that that option doesn't really seem a good option to me. Um, the, another option that people have thrown out is this idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So, in, in Matthew chapter twelve, um, Jesus in, in, is being confronted by the. Uh, by the Pharisees um, and they're confronting him about a miracle that he that he uh, com he performed um, of casting out demons and they say to him you cast out demons by Beelzebub the prince of demons and then Jesus gives this little statement about well how can how can satan cast out satan if a house is divided against itself it can't stand if i if i cast out demons it's by by the power of god not the power of satan and then he says uh every other sin will be forgiven man but he who blasphemes against the holy spirit it will not be forgiven not in this life or in the life to come um, and the idea seems to be that they took something that was clearly the work of God and attributed it to the devil. It wasn't a question. It wasn't, well, this, you know, is this God or not? I mean, it was clearly that Jesus, they took, they took the work of Jesus that was clearly done by the power of God and attributed it to Satan. And Jesus called that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's some that said, this is what's being talked about here. Um, the other option, and some would say this is what the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, by the way. It's this idea of the full and final rejection of the gospel. And if you take what John is saying in the overall context of what he's been saying, uh, the, the backdrop of these false teachers that have come in and, and, and led people astray and rejected the teaching of the apostles about who Jesus was. 
it seems as though this is what he's talking about. That 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 once someone we're not some, talking about someone who's under conviction and doesn't walk the aisle this Sunday. We're talking about someone who has who has made their full and final decision. I know about Jesus. I understand, but I want no part of it. I'm, I'm, I, I'm walking away. I'm not even talking about the Apostle Paul, as we saw this this morning, how you know he was convinced that Jesus wasn't real until God turned him around. But the full and final rejection that, that, that I, I've heard about Jesus, I know about Jesus, I want no part of him. The full and final rejection of Jesus, as John seems to believe these false teachers have done. He says they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us. He says, I don't, this is the sin leading to death. In other words, they have rejected life in Christ and chosen the death of rejecting him. And I don't say you, you should pray for him. This is what I... This is what I believe he's talking about here. The, the full and final rejection of Jesus Christ as demonstrated by what the false teachers have done here. So this is, this is my take on it. Now, why would John say not to pray for this person? Their decision's been made. Their decision's been made. It, it won't do any good. He's not saying it's wrong. He's not saying it's a sin to pray for them. He's just saying... If you want your prayers answered, here's one that I'm telling you right now it won't be. Um, that that you're talking about praying in, in the will of God. <clears throat> to pray for someone who has already made up their mind, their full and final decision. I know all about Jesus and I don't want him. He says, I don't say you should pray for him because they've made their decision. And they've chosen death over life. They've chosen Satan over Jesus. And so it, it, it won't do any good. It won't be answered. You know, I've got, I've got family members, and I'll be careful since this is going out on YouTube. But I have family members that some, I have family members that are atheists, and then I have other family members that are convinced that that you know I'm you know I'm claiming claiming his salvation in in the name of Jesus, and I'm just I'm never going to quit quit believing and I'm never going to quit praying that, that one day sometime before he dies he's going to trust Jesus I hope nobody wishes that more than me but I believe that you know I believe that he he's made his decision and he probably made it a long time ago now could God turn him around absolutely and nobody would be more happy about that than me and, and I pray for my my lost family members but I'm not sure I'm not sure that's a prayer that's going to be answered not because God can't save not because my prayer isn't sincere but because that person made their decision a long time ago and, and they continue to walk further into death and darkness as opposed to in the light of Jesus Christ now there are some people there's some people, and you may be one of them, who say, that's Brother Mark, that's horrible. How could you say such a thing? You should never give up. I understand. Uh, but I'm, I'm telling you, I believe that's what John is saying here. He said, wipe the dust off your feet. Yeah, wipe the dust off your feet. Exactly. Um, you know, like I said, if, they, if, this, if, if, if those people turn to Christ, no one will be happier than me. But John is saying, you know, there is a sin that leads to death. And the full and final rejection of Jesus Christ, that's it. And I, he said, I don't say you should pray for him because I don't think it's a prayer that will be answered. So I think that's I think that's the idea that, that he's talking about here. So Mark, yes. Is it, I mean, if we were living in the time of Saul, as you preached this morning. Yes. Right before God struck him down on the road to Damascus, do you think that there were people around him that had, I mean, believers who thought that about him? <coughs> There's no possible way that that man could ever come to Oh, I, I absolutely do. And I think that's one of the things that made him such a uh, powerful tool uh, because 
you know, he was able to say, I know the grace of God is real because I experienced it firsthand. So sometimes God breaks through the darkness in miraculous ways. Uh, but we also see by the fact that he turned to Christ, he had not rejected Christ fully and finally, you know, even though at the time it may have appeared that way. So I think, you know, the flip side of that is you also have to be careful that you don't assume someone has rejected Christ fully, uh, you know, if they, if there's still hope, you know, so they're, you kind of got to be careful with that. So it's really hard to balance with love. Yeah. This whole thing being about love, because, you know, even Paul said, I wish that even I myself would be a curse for the Jews to come to Christ. Now, that's really love. Right. I don't have that level of love for lost people, but, but it, it, I, I just, you know, I have a lot of family members that I've wanted to give up on to, you yeah. know, that I just haven't been able to get. Right. I, I, can't, I have a hard time balancing is that love like we're talking about or is that you know maybe i'm looking at it too emotional i don't know mm -hmm. well and I, I think keep in mind that the backdrop of all of this is the false teachers that, that are not just saying well i don't believe in god but they're in leading the little sheep away and i you know leading them astray and i think that is one of the things that john is kind of keying on here is it's not just that that they are lost and going to hell but they're they're bent on carrying other people with them and so he you know he he's saying that they will you know they are it, it will be manifested in them what you know they're who they truly are they you know that's why he's they left the, the fellowship they went out from us because they were not of us they were never part of the part of the believers to begin with and he said they they you know they rejected Christ and he said they are you know they have chosen the path of death over life I don't say that you pray for him because they've already made their decision um, not that not that you're sinning to do to pray for them it's just it's just a prayer that's not going to be answered not because of God what God wants but because of the choices that they've made so well and also starting out in 14 he was talking about you know, the having confidence in what you pray and it'll be answered. And now he's he's coming back and he's saying, you know, except for right. those that have decided that Jesus is not the Messiah. Right. It's yeah, like, I mean, don't, there's, you know, there's no confidence that your prayer now is going to be answered. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the idea. You, you can't pray somebody into heaven that, that, doesn't want Jesus. I think that's really what's being said here. You, you can't, no matter how bad you want it for them, you can't pray someone into heaven that that doesn't want Jesus. I think that's the, the point here. So, yes. The sin leading to death, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, do what? You're going to die in your sin. That's right. So, in other words, the, this is the sin leading to death. They're not dead yet, and they're not they're not in hell yet. But they've chosen a path that will take them there. That that's the idea there. Now, could could something change to get them off of that path? Well, sure. I mean, it it did with the Apostle Paul, didn't it? But but they've chosen a path that is leading them to death and damnation. Um, and it seems as though they've made their choice. So even when faced with the truth of Jesus, they still reject. It. Not someone who hadn't heard about Jesus or someone who's wrestling with a decision about Jesus, someone who's heard the truth, heard the facts, understands and makes their decision. And their decision is, no, I don't want Jesus. Mark, that's like the very from young ruler. Yeah. Went away sorrowful. Yeah. He knew. He knew. That's right. So I think that's the idea there. All right. Well, let's uh, let's just finish this up here. Um, 
Let's look at the last little set of verses here. Verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Okay, so this idea that whoever is born of God doesn't sin, what's the idea there? Keep on sinning. Keep on sinning. Yeah, so it's a, a present tense verb that means continuing action. So not to continue in, in sin. We don't continue in sin because God gives us power to overcome sin. That's the idea there. And then the, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on was the last thing he says that almost, again, seems like at first glance, he kind of pulls it out of the blue. He's talking about love and he's talking about um, false teachers and he's talking about, you know, Jesus as the son of God. And then he, he ends by saying this, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And then he, then, and that's it. Little, keep yourselves from idols, amen. That's, that's the end of the letter. So why? Why would he say this? What does he mean? What are the idols that he's talking about here? You will resemble what you love. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when, generally, what we think of when we when we think of idols are, you know, the uh, you know, like the golden calf that the children of Israel, you know, uh, melt, you know created in the, in the wilderness while Moses was up on Mount Sinai. In the context, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think, again, he's got in mind the false teacher, uh, the false teachers that, um, you know, an idol is anything that occupies the place of God in, in our life. That's, that's an idol. And so in, in context of the false teachers, the false teachers had created a false god that there was actually a false image of god that they were that they were perpetrating to the believers that this is who god is well it was nothing about who god was um you know they they, they said that jesus christ uh, wasn't his son that he had not come in the flesh uh that you can uh, love god and still hate your brothers you can i mean all kinds of weird things that they were saying about god that it simply was not true that it was not the god that they were presenting was not the one true god and so um the god of the false teachers was not the the, the real god but but the the god that that they were denying the person and work of the, the one that they in uh, the god of man's imagination that the false teachers had created in, of their own imagination. This is who they were putting forth as God. And John is just saying, stay away. You know the one true God. Stay away from anything that's not the one true God because that's an idol. So that's the idea there. So in uh, C.S. Lewis's little uh, children's book series, The Chronicles of Narnia, I said something about the Chronicles of Narnia the other day, and somebody said, oh, I love that movie. I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about the book series. In the last book of the series called The Last Battle, you know, the, the Christ figure, it's an allegory, and the Christ figure in the book is this lion named Aslan, okay? So in the last book of the series, these two apes, these two monkeys or whatever they are, they find this lion skin. It's just, it's not a lion, it's just a lion skin. And they, they make, they get it in their head. What if we can, what if we can convince people that, that this is actually Aslan? And so they take, and they find this old donkey, <laughs> just an old donkey. And they take this lion skin and they put it on the donkey. And they begin to tell everybody, this is Aslan. This is the great lion Aslan. Well, and people start believing it. They start believing this is Lot. This is Aslan the lion. And over the course of time, 
it comes out that this really isn't Aslan. It's just a donkey with a with the lion skin on it, and nothing more. And so people, it's interesting how, how C.S. Lewis captures the heart of people. Because the people in the story, they don't say, I knew that that donkey was never really Aslan to begin with. They start to say, I knew Aslan was never real to begin with. Lewis is a master of capturing what the, the heart of this world. We create, our world creates these false gods that are never really God to begin with. A God that is my genie in the bottle, a God that, that, uh, that, I, that will do my bidding, a God that anything I, I, I say, I can name, I can claim, and he's honor bound to, to do it. And then, over the course of time, when it's revealed that that's not really God, that's not who God is, God doesn't operate that way, Instead of saying, well, I knew that wasn't the way God really was, people instead walk away from God completely and say, I knew God was never real to begin with. Oh, God is real, my friends, but the idol that you've created in your mind, that's what's not real. God was very real, but the, the idol of a God that these false teachers had created was false. John is saying, keep yourself from all idols, anything that is not the one true God. You know who the true God is. You know his son. You know the love that he has and the love that he commands us to have for one another. Stay with the one true God. Avoid idols because otherwise you, you'll be the one to say, when those false gods are are proven false and, and all false gods ultimately will be proven false. You don't want to be in the situation to say when that false idol is proven false, you don't want to be in the position to have to say, I was pretty sure God wasn't really real to begin with. Keep yourself from idols, he says, and then ends the book by saying, amen. Questions or comments? <laughs> that make you think of the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Uh, if I only had a brain. So anyway. Uh, okay. So uh, Wednesday night uh, we'll we'll cover Second and Third John. We'll cover Second John before supper and Third John after supper. Uh, so I hope you make plans to be back for that. And let's close in a word of prayer and be free to go, Heavenly.